Good evening, everybody. Uh, for those of you uh, getting ready to charrette, uh, it's fantastic you came down. Uh, this lecture got moved from Halloween for various reasons, and it was amazing that we were able to jump. It now runs right up against final reviews, but uh, knowing Yang Ho Chang and his wife and partner, Li Jia Lu, I think this will be a very inspiring lecture, so I feel like it's wonderfully timed. Uh, I want to thank our dean, Andres Hyake, for making this possible today. Uh, it was Wei Ping uh, Wu, our interim dean, last spring, met with Young Ho, uh, just casually, and uh, got to know each other a little bit, and Wei Ping suggested that uh, Young Ho come to lecture. Andres uh, became dean in the summer and then completed that transaction uh, very nicely and very cordially. Uh, asked Galia Somanoff, who is here somewhere, uh, and myself to, to do a follow-up this semester, the lectures I've attended, the questions that came out of the audience were amazing. Um, uh, I could quote them, and I actually intended to, but uh, I heard at Emmanuel Admasu's lectures questions about myth and autobiography, which actually blew my mind. Uh, I texted Sanford Quinter, who's sitting here, that someone had brought up Donna Haraway during the Brown labor. Uh, Donna Haraway was a major author in Sanford's book, Incorporations. But uh, so I think Galia uh, probably do a better job than I about holding back and letting the questions come from the audience. But uh, as a precursor, I wanted to take a minute to uh, help introduce Young Ho Chang. And this slide has been up for a moment, so we can actually move it. Uh, Young Ho is a, is a partner with his wife, Li Jia, in a Beijing-based practice. Uh, but has a history uh, in academia, which is and architectural practice that is not entirely uncommon, but is extraordinarily devoted uh, to both sides. And over the years, uh, I have full confession, I met Young Ho in 1985 and have been great friends with him ever since. Uh, I don't like those personal kind of introductions for a public lecture, but here it's unavoidable. So, uh, but I can say that having known Young Ho all those years, we continually circle back to try and understand the influences on us collectively, uh, he and I together, Li Jia, but also just on having spent so much time in architecture schools with the aspiration of practice. And uh, I will say you know, very clearly that I think Young Ho, despite prolific practice now for 30 years, is really still often sorting out what he thinks about things, even under this immense pressure of realizing them. And uh, he's done this at Berkeley, at Rice at MIT, where he served as chair and head, and uh, as a visiting professor at all the major schools around the world. And uh, he's continually doing this. He and I, you might call it nostalgia, I think it's better than that, but we go back and remember what was Horst Riddle saying at Berkeley, and did we understand it? Or those Chris Alexander lectures, did we understand them, and is it, should we go back to that? And uh, so it's not nostalgia so much as really trying to sort out these influences. But I think he, uh, when I introduced Young Ho to uh, Wei Ping last spring, uh, I suggested that this is somebody who I think you know, is both at the cutting edge of practice, but nonetheless continually reflecting on education, and of course has had major roles in education. So I don't mean to make it seem as if he hasn't. The Young Ho I know, uh, I feel cliche to do this, but he did a project when he was fresh out of school based on Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. And I was there, I, I saw the project happen, and um, that model is a picture today in his, uh, on his bookcase in Manhattan. Uh, but one thing about the film, aside from the fact that it's architectural and ocular and perspectival and full of drama and it, it's high art and it's also popular media, all of these things are really in Young Ho's lexicon uh, to go from post-structuralism to comedy. Um, Hitchcock is, in some cases, shows up, and in this one picture here, he shows up in the film. And aside from the fact that it's Hitchcock and Young Ho has specific interest in that, uh, I've often felt that what really made him timely and continues to make him timely, tonight hopefully we get into the new things, was that he was reflecting on being in and out of the scene. Uh, he's the author of the project and he's in the project. And I think you know, architecturally speaking, the last 30 years we have all returned to this over and over again post-structuralist questions about authorship and control and power versus critiquing having said authority, and meanwhile having to find the agency to build. When Young Ho uh, returned to Beijing in 1995, I guess full-time, 
was back and forth, but really people thought of, I thought of Jung Ho, and I think most people thought of Jung Ho as somebody who was quite happy drawing. This is one of his drawings uh, from the later years in Berkeley. He later built this. But a kind of exquisite practice of drawing paper architecture, and one wasn't entirely sure that it wouldn't stay there. Um, I've kind of stayed there more than I should have. Um, but Young Ho returned to Beijing. The first project was a bookstore uh, where the bookcases moved on a bicycle wheel. And this kind of mix of like the cerebral and the popular, the vernacular and, and the heady, uh, uh, I think a, a more uh, <laughs> menacing project, perhaps the third police station. I always thought of this as a kind of Duchampian bicycle wheel, but I won't go into that now. Young Ho can resort to uh, ways to describe his work as straight out of his life as a, a young child and, and young man in China before he came to the US as a result of the Cultural Revolution, landing at Ball State University in Indiana, and then later Berkeley. Uh, but here, a project in a journal that Steve Hall, myself, Yehuda Saffron, and Andrew McNair created and edited, uh, Commitment to Dim Sum. There's a humor there, but a seriousness. This was 32, one of the many things Young Ho has worked on in the States over the years. I think we did 13 issues, uh, largely on computers at Stephen's office. It got more rigorous when we had an uh, editorial help from Daniela Fabricius, Sanford might know that. Uh, but then on the other end of it, the Young Ho that's harder for me to understand, even though I've known him for so long, is the Young Ho that does projects like this. <laughs> and <laughs> I can understand it literally, but tonight maybe we're gonna be there more in the talk and this little preamble is uh, helpful or not. But uh, this, is, this is not one building by Young Ho, but many. He did all of them, <laughs> so, and uh, Li Jia, I'm sure, uh, uh, knowing Li Jia, I think that's probably very much Li Jia making that happen. Um, there's also uh, interspersed, uh, very innovative work around material. Young Ho will warn, warns people all the time to not lose sight of architecture in the face of big urban questions. This was uh, work putting concrete into fiberglass tubes and using, uh, I guess while you were chair at MIT, using maybe MIT demanded research from you, but, uh, but actually realizing that. Uh, the Young Ho, uh, I have most recently really watched in a lecture, I've seen several in the last few years, but back in 2013, I was in Shanghai and attended a lecture, you must have had a thousand people listening at an auditorium on the Huangpu River, part of a project we were all involved in, and you showed Siegfried Leverance. And, urgently told a thousand young architecture students that they should not lose sight of the small. And this was contextualized in the, in the massive urbanization of China 30 years into that. And maybe that will come up tonight. Uh, we, I'm assuming you learned about Ziggard Leverance from Lars Lehrer or Stanley Sadowitz at Berkeley, uh, two immensely influential professors, uh, very gifted designers, but uh, people that set a milieu that I think Young Ho uh, had a lot, gained immense amount from, as, as did I, and of course many. Um, returning to China, a well-known project, the Split House, purposely shown only vaguely here, but it shows in a model, this is rammed earth construction. What isn't obvious, and maybe we'll see it tonight, is that it's kind of at the bottom of a giant hill, like a dam. And as much as it's a vernacular and serious work about place, it's also precarious, and I think like much of the work we're going to see is saying, yes, I'm in practice, but I'm not normal. And uh, that's, in fact, part of the name of the company. So this is not intended to be followed, but Young Ho graduated from Ball State University, uh, later got his, uh, he already had pretty much a degree in architecture from China. His father was the architect for the museum on the Tiananmen Square. But after the Cultural Revolution, you and his brother, he and his brother came to the United States landed at Ball State, then Berkeley. Uh, in questions, I might bring some of these things up, but the School of Architecture at Berkeley is founded in 1959 there in red. It was only a few years later that the world came undone in the 60s, and uh, Berkeley really kind of perhaps followed suit. But in that aftermath, uh, that school, uh, which is a school I dearly love, uh, was really pluralistic and diverse, and to get through it, you really, could tap into unbelievable professors, but you had to build some identity for yourself. A lot of that happened by going over to Bill Stout Books, where the books were expensive, but you could read them. And uh, Steve Hall worked at Bill Stout Books, uh, just uh, as a young man. 
Just prior to moving back to China, used, uh, Young Ho taught at Rice. Uh, his home is there at the Red Arrow. It was about four doors down from the Chinese consulate. So maybe we should have seen it coming that he wasn't going to stay at Rice much longer. Uh, and he took off. So uh, <laughs> I asked him today for something personal. This is Young Ho skating at Michigan. And that is Lee San Couture in the front. So he does know how to have fun. And at the end of the semester, I thought it was worthwhile uh, showing some of that. So that makes it possible for my questions really to be already queued up. But uh, this is somebody who's got three and a half decades of experience across building and teaching. Where to begin with a career like that? We'll now leave it up to Young Ho to tell us what he wants to do in this room. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Now that uh, you did the lecture, maybe I should <laughs> introduce you. But anyway, uh, I'll have some slides, and uh, I'll pick up the conversation you started, uh, um, and, and, and then maybe evolve into a, a discussion of something I, I, I'm really uh, um, f focusing on today. Anyway, so you see, uh, a peculiar graphic design that, oh, what should I use to click? Is that a, on, on the keyboard? OK. Yeah. So what do you see here uh, is not for, uh, for today. I thought I wanted to, to show you because that would make a point. <laughs> if we did a lecture uh, on the uh, original date, which is a Halloween night, of course. But the point I'd like to make is that, so what you see here is not form follows function, but rather the other way around. is function, or rather content, follows form, which is something I'll, I'll talk shortly. And then, of course, we are back to normal, so you see the title again. <laughs> so what? Where I'd like to start, I already mentioned, is this very important slogan suggested um, by the American architect, Louis Sullivan. However, today, I would ask this question. Let me show you why that question is relevant, perhaps even important. So um, first of all, I like to uh, uh, define the word form, because I'm not only using the definition of form as what you'll find in Oxford English Dictionary, which is figure, um, shape, appearance, and also could be a structure, system, and organization. I'm defining it according to the traditional Chinese poem, which is discipline. There's a one word we use in Chinese is lü. Literally, it means discipline. So what it means is that it's a set of rules you set up for a poem to be poem. So here you see, so there are four lines, of course, and each line has five characters. And then beyond that, the pitch of every single character, there are four of them, is dictated. You can't pick a word with the wrong pitch. And then it rhymes. So I'm going to read it in Chinese just for uh, giving you a little flavor how it sounds. So, Wen xing cai wei liang, xiang mao jie wei yu. 不知动理云,去做人间语. What, it, uh, uh, what the poem talked about in, in translation, as you can see directly, actually is about the building of a building. So imagine if we talk about it, we meaning architects, it could be then all in very uh, uh, everyday language, our professional jargons. But only when you have this set of rules, the lü, or form rather, the form enables words become poetry. 
And then the question I have is that would a form enable building to be architecture? So we'll find out. So this is a, an image probably uh, you have seen uh, hundreds of times, thousands of times. You're probably pretty tired of. But anyway, so what I like to suggest is that it's a question, so what is the form of a glass house? We may think about glass, the material, we may think about the steel frame for the Fungsworth house. They are all pretty important, but the most important thing is transparency. Because of transparency, the house has to be extroverted towards outside as well as inside. So a glass house by nature cannot have rooms because anything in the middle would have block transparency. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Mies didn't have rooms or rather almost didn't have any rooms. There is a core with two bathrooms and a mechanical room. I would imagine Mies probably hated the, the, its existence, but had to have it. You know, it's a compromise. And then for uh, uh, Philip Johnson, the same story is open both to the outside and to the inside. Of course, no rooms. It's a one room building. And, and with uh, a cylindrical form uh, or shape for, uh, for a bathroom. And that bit of uh, obstruction to uh, transparency, the bathroom, probably uh, Johnson didn't want it anyway either. So what is a glass house? If I could uh, diagram it, would it be uh, pure or rather an absolutely pure space? So that makes a glass house a glass house. The dotted line is an area we, we, again, architects, we don't want it probably, but we have to have it. So without it, would it be the true essence of a glass house? And then a glass house with four rooms is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense because you can't have rooms. Or really, so that's, again, something. So Michael already uh, introduced uh, the vertical glass house. That was one of the glass houses uh, I designed while I was teaching at Berkeley in 1991. And I didn't have a client, uh, I didn't have a site, I didn't have uh, an office. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I, I was uh, uh, thinking of glass house at that time already. Um, in this case, I wonder how a glass house could be urban because Farnsworth and Johnson's house, they were in beautiful landscape. So the transparency is horizontal. It's possible that the house would be very open yet wouldn't have problem with uh, privacy. And then in the city, I think because there are gonna be neighbors, gonna be density so that the glass house may need to go the other way. So here you see a four uh, floors from the left is a basement level. Um, there's a, a heater and also the plumbing. What Michael didn't know, he didn't know everything, right? I mean, he sounds like he knows everything. <laughs> I Actually, school didn't teach me how to uh, draw the plumbing right. So I went down to uh, is hardware store, picked up a, a book, not, not William Stouts, but is hardware, which taught me how to draw correctly uh, all the uh, hardwares anyway. So the second drawing from the left is the ground floor. So you enter from that floor and then that's where you get the facilities such as uh, the bathtub and toilet and so on. And further moving up is the floor with furniture. And then on the top level 
It's a double high space where a person could uh, meditate and so on. So it's the, uh, the, the more uh, spiritual space in the house. That was in 1991. And then uh, you saw that drawing. What's interesting was that I didn't realize, actually I was putting rooms inside the house, of course vertically. So the basement is one room, and then there's a bathroom, there's a furniture room, and there is an empty room. So it's a glass house with rooms. And it looks like this from the outside and then the inside. So who's a client? I imagined a third century Chinese poet and thinker, um, his name is Liu Ling, to be my client. The reason was that he was so poor that when he came home every time, he would take off the only clothes he had, a robe, and put it on side to stay naked. And then he famously said when he had a visitor uh, question his uh, nudity and he said, the sky and the earth is my house. And then this piece of architecture is my clothes. So why should I wear anything? So very philosophical. And then um, our uh, photographer, he was really inspired by the story, then so he posed naked here. Uh, both figures are, are our photographer. And then you see him uh, later on in all of our projects, naked, of course. <laughs> and then, of course, I'm challenging the oxymoron. Why can't a glass house have rooms, could it, is there a way rather to really create a glass house with rooms? So I tried again, this time I was interested in putting a cruise form double layered glass wall inside of a house so that a glass house would have four rooms. This is the initial drawings uh, I, I made again in 91. I don't uh, draw like this anymore. I, I don't have time. It's very time consuming. Maybe that's just an excuse. Uh, but anyway, so at that time, I was still thinking that the living room should be bigger, the, the bathroom the smallest, and so on. But later on, I realized they could be all have the same size. And also, I actually, I realized uh, Mr. Johnson had a problem turning the corner for his house with the I column in the glass. So the, the corner, I didn't point that out, I'm sorry, but the corner I column is half exposed to the outside, half covered by the uh, glass. So maybe I could have solved that problem on the way too is to pull the structure back into the house in the form of four pieces of load-bearing walls. Meanwhile, close, enclose rather the uh, uh, glass house with a garden or courtyard wall so that a glass house in some way is also introverted rather than purely uh, extroverted. So I did all these moves and then after uh, 31 years, I drew the house initially and it was built, I'll show it. And then the, the cruise form shape is important um, only in such a way. This is uh, an exhibition we did. Uh, and this range finders is, is part of the in installation. And when you see the cross, Actually, it's about aiming onto a mark, of course, uh, of uh, a cruise form shape. As you see here, it doesn't have any uh, religious connotations, but uh, still people may think, hey, there is uh, something holy. Uh, so we try to, to photograph uh, 
it in a different way. But it appears to uh, say no. So uh, anyway, it's really about an experience. You see four spaces, which uh, I was on the construction side. A, a kid all of a sudden showed up. As a, it's about these kind of a visual connections and then it could happen inside. So that's uh, from last week. And the house are pretty much done and the furnitures are not in. And then so you can see uh, uh, the four uh, rooms. They're of the same shape, of course, uh, size. Visually, it's still one building and yet they are rooms. So I was probably uh, a little bit like solving a mathematical problem and say, let's try to, uh, to solve this uh, oxymoron. And then when you look down to the uh, ground level, it's all uh, laboratories, but don't also uh, be uh, misled by me. Uh, me. Lab here meaning this kind of uh, research, cooking for instance, so it's uh, a, a lot for, for, uh, for making food. And then here you see uh, the low bearing wall is pushed in so that you can see a perfect glass corner. And then here uh, you, you see uh, again the uh, bathroom. For privacy, uh, we decided to have curtains. So when needed, you can close uh, the bathroom up. And that's uh, the outside. Um, the glass house is on top level. Again, the laboratories uh, downstairs. And then on the right is a staircase to go up to the house, uh, to the, the, the residential part. So anyway, What's interesting for me is that after all this effort to imagine this quarter space and so on, and, and uh, I, I, try, I did do a diagram, which is totally unnecessary because that diagram existed since at least the beginning of 19th century. It's waiting for some architects to really uh, use it. So from the, the first column from the, the left, the fourth one is right there. And then of course, uh, you'll probably find uh, uh, Mr. John Haydock's uh, favorite uh, diagram is up there too. With a diff oh, it's the second row, uh, the third one, uh, uh, the second one from the top. So anyway, so in fact, from that period, of course, this is in France. So this diagram got a different name, which is Parti. They are not meant to be anything stylistic, but rather like the form of the Chinese poetry. It's a set of rules you can take, you can select and use. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's uh, some kind of uh, uh, intelligence. Often that uh, today we uh, we uh, uh, we forget. We like to think that uh, we could uh, uh, start a design from nothing. It's sort of a, a mental uh, tabula rasa. But actually, uh, there's so much there uh, already. Uh, we could uh, uh, explore and take advantage. So I'm gonna talk about one I used before I knew the drawing. So now I'm smarter, I can go into the drawing and look around. It's the second one, uh, I'm mean, sorry, the, the first one on the second row. I call that one uh, triptych. Triptych is a box with drawing inside. Now in the church, you, you open up like that. So it's something like this. So I, Actually, uh, you, you're gonna uh, see uh, two uh, uh, versions. One is later, but it got built earlier. So there's uh, um, analytical set of plans, which is 
an exploration of what this triptych plan may do. And we end up building the one uh, on, the, uh, on the right, the, the, the lowest one on the right. And then by doing so, it's not only a formal gesture for the sake of doing it, but rather to keep the trees in, in its uh, uh, place. And then, of course, creating a courtyard. And Michael mentioned something uh, uh, maybe I should explain. So he saw the house as a dam because the water would run down the, uh, um, the slope, of course, and then passing through the house. I, I made the, the glass in the entry lobby transparent so that actually you can even see the water going through the house. So conceptually, it is very much like a dam. And then, of course, this is the older version and now is finishing up the triptych house for a scholar. So I had a two uh, imagined clients. This is not very interesting. It's, it's a scholar uh, and, and a visual artist. Uh, probably the roles I, I uh, or rather uh, the, the people I admire very much. So here you work on one side, which is on the right hand side. I'm sorry, uh, on the uh, left-hand side for you. And then on the right-hand side is where you live. And then in the middle, uh, this is from the outside. So in the middle is a court. And then there are two inverted porches on the ground level so that actually there is a hidden cross in this case. So you see, one space, which is the court in the middle, um, with, with uh, of course a little island in the middle, goes one direction and perpendicularly, and then you see the porches making the cross that way. So anyway, the building in the back. I'm sorry that uh, you don't see. The entirety of it is actually a beautiful art museum by Avro Siza, the dark building. So, and this is a downstairs, again, a kitchen. And then you go upstairs and you into the living room. And then, of course, you have to go down and cross a courtyard to go into a very uh, Classic or even classical library is dark with uh, eventually a lot of books. So I, the idea is that the life of the scholar uh, gets uh, reorganized a little bit. And then you need to experience odor and you, you need to really um, compare uh, the differences of these two spaces, which structures the daily life of a scholar. And then the third one is for a visual artist. It's the one with something poking out on the wall. That's the end of a beam. So this is the, the beam house, you may say. And then you see the beam comes in and goes through the entire studio. And then uh, uh, this is uh, in the studio. And then actually the beam is walkable. So one can walk on top of the beam to look at her work or his work, be it sculpture or a big painting on the wall. So like that. And then look out onto the landscape. And then uh, on one side of this, uh, again, uh, uh, cruise form uh, beam. Uh, where you stand is where the staircase is. And then you cross the entire length of the beam to reach your uh, little uh, study. And then you, if you take the staircase and then you go upstairs, there is a terrace. 
and, and on your uh, left hand side, and there is a kitchen and dining. So you can have friends over and have a party on the, on the roof terrace, like that. And uh, the last one uh, is uh, a house with an inverted roof. And, and this one also opens to the little town square in the middle, like that. So basically, you see a, um, a studio site. And then on the other side, there is a, a mezzanine, which is the living, living quarters. So basically, the beam or the roof, they started again to suggest a different ways of living. So in the end, it's not so much having an idea of how to live and then you design this particular space or this piece of architecture. Rather, you have the idea of the space, of the architecture first, and then started to imagine how to really live there and work there. And then you see uh, our dear photographer again. And this is uh, it's through that door, uh, by the way, uh, right, right there. There you go, yeah. I, I bet he probably actually took a shower. <laughs> uh, but anyway. So four parties you know, from the uh, arrow photo, you can, you can tell. And then four pieces of architecture, four different ways of living. So form follows function, or function follows form. It's still a, a, a question, and however, let me take you uh, one step further. Um, it's a different notion. So let's say nobody follows anyone, but rather could form, creates content. Still uh, doing uh, diagrams of parties, um, this one, Again, back to a quarter square. However, I turn the cross in the middle, 45 degrees, cut out the central portion of the space. So it's not gonna be for a triangular uh, room, but rather a courtyard house. And this is a traditional courtyard house in Beijing, and it's pretty much similar to the one I grew up in. And uh, today, if we look at it, the cultural value of it is undeniable and uh, unquestionable. However, as far as life in there, and we have some issues, one is that when you go from one room to another, you always go through the courtyard. It's not the most convenient. And it, it rings, it, you know, as we all know, it's too cold or too warm, and so on, so that uh, it, it really would make the everyday life little, you know, a little inconvenient. And then when we open the door, either in the winter or in the summer, you lose energy. That wouldn't be the way we think about how a house should be organized in terms of uh, uh, the issue of, of uh, energy. So we thought for a small site, the house might be uh, like this one. First of all, um, we of course have a courtyard in the middle in, in a, a decent size. The size of spaces in architecture, of course, is uh, super important. The traditional house typically is 10 meter by 10 meter. Um, and then uh, this is a small lot, so we could have it six meters by seven meters. It's a little smaller, but not too small. So at the expense of the depth of the room. So we decided the only way to make the house work, again, is to imagine a different lifestyle. In this case, is to live in to live around the clock. So in the morning, you're on the west side. So you have breakfast there, the morning sun will come in. And then 
with the sun, you move to the north. Then in the afternoon, you, you're on the eastern side. You are having more sunlight. And then in the evening, and you have the dining space on the south. It's darker, and you, you can entertain friends. So basically, the whole idea here is making a loop of a space, or rather living space. Just a, again, it's a, not only a one space house. You heard that term when I talk about the glass house. And I would like to suggest this is a glass house. So you'll see. Um, this is the house from the outside. Um, if the facade uh, means a uh, mask, um, here you see uh, truly a mask. And then once you go in, it's like this. Um, it, it is a traditional uh, um, courtyard house, you may say still, but yet if you look at the continuous glass elevation around the courtyard, you may realize this is the Fangsworth house turned totally inside, inward. So it's a glass house within a, a more traditional house. And that's once you enter that um, facade from a, a hutong, an alleyway, and then you go through this space, and then you are in this uh, um, looping uh, um, living space. And then in the morning, and then uh, at the west side, and you're going around with the light to the north and to the east, and then in the evening. So you're looking at the southern wind of the house. And uh, uh, there are things we uh, didn't or couldn't possibly program. So when I'm saying that we like to imagine lifestyle, uh, it's really a suggestion or an invitation to our clients. Would you like to try to live in a certain way? And in this case, our best clients, not the parents, but the kids, they love the house. That's why they do it. There are two boys and a girl. They love to run around <laughs> the, uh, the courtyard inside. Of course, uh, this is the one evening. You see the kids running, the parents either cooking or entertaining uh, some guests who are the, uh, the architects, uh, as you can see here. And then uh, because of uh, the structure uh, we uh, designed, we ended up with some very strange details. Um, we are still trying to digest if uh, uh, there's something else could be done. But uh, you see the traditional tiles and then the, the steel structure uh, would, would create uh, such a, a corner together. So here, again, um, designing the space of the house and the act of programming the spaces are two acts of design actually very much uh, uh, merged together. So. Uh, here I'd like to, uh, to jump into a particular problem of, uh, of these kind of spatial diagrams or parties. This one, I don't know if it's really just called aggregation. Oh, I, I, I missed uh, an R there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, see, the problem of aggregation is pretty straightforward. So you have the repetition of one standard unit. And it's that diagram on the uh, top left. And uh, you, 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 you have the idea. And then, of course, with the number of repetitions, uh, in any case, you would need a, a circulation space. So you may have a double-loaded corridor 
as on your uh, upper right hand corner, and then you go down is the double loaded corridor. Double loaded corridor sounds like something generic. For the students, you may not realize because its popularity rather, it actually has dominated architecture and our life, our life collectively for centuries. It's no joke someone would have born in a hospital with double loaded corridor and then went to kindergarten, elementary school, high school, college, or, or in a double loaded corridor building. And then you end up working in an office during the day in a double loaded corridor building and went home for a double loaded corridor apartment. It's, it's a sad life. <laughs> um, so uh, we, uh, for years now, it's not easy, it's not easy. We, uh, we put up a fight uh, with, with this particular uh, party, if I may say. And then I personally had the, uh, the really the luck uh, to experience maybe the best double loaded corridor building in the world, which is in Trieste, Italy, is the center uh, for a pure uh, uh, theoretical uh, physics. And in the uh, department for mathematics is this diagram, yes, the lower uh, left one. So the rooms are tiny for the, for the mathematicians, probably uh, no bigger than, than the lantern, yet the, the corridor became this huge open public space. So there are cafe, there are ping pong table, there are all the things. So I think the idea is very powerful. When you have this tiny little personal space, you have to be in the public space. And, and then of course subvert it all together, uh, the notion of a double loaded corridor. So we, uh, the project I like to show is the uh, Maison de la Chine, the China house in Paris. Uh, we won the competition, um, and then I gave you a little bit of history. So about 100 years ago, 1920, so it's, it's 102 years ago, the Parisian government wanted to create uh, some places for students to live. Otherwise, as you know, the left bank, there's only universities and research institutions and so on. There's, there's, uh, you have to rent like any uh, person in Paris actually compete with them to get a, a place to live. So, and then again, the Parisian government invited all countries in the world to build a dormitory for, uh, for their students and other students. The deal is that you build the building, you give to uh, Paris as a gift, and uh, you can have 70% of the rooms for the students from your own country and 30 from uh, all over and from uh, France, even from uh, Paris. And then, uh, so our site is over uh, on the uh, right, right, upper right hand corner. And then in the uh, uh, 1930s, um, there was uh, a Chinese architecture student in Paris for uh, his uh, uh, graduation project. He imagined a house for Chinese students. His name is uh, Yu Bing Lie, and uh, he. Uh, um, it's long gone, and he had a, a ra rather a short life. So uh, there are a lot of answered questions. One of them, why he imagined uh, a dormitory that big, is 300 rooms. And then the famous Swiss house by Corbeau, 45 rooms. Okay, Swiss, uh, our Switzerland was, was uh, our still is a smaller country, but anyway. It's interesting that he organized possibly, uh, well, it's probably not very interesting. So 
For me, the problem is the double loaded corridor, you can imagine, in, in this building. And then, uh, meanwhile, Corbeau did single loaded corridor. So that not only in the rooms, there's going to be sunlight and view, even in the corridor, there's light, air, and view. Because Corbeau's concern is very contemporary. He was thinking of the health of the residents. So I thought maybe we should uh, really take on that, that uh, clue, which is uh, you know, a healthy life for, for, for the students. And then uh, this is again a single loaded corridor, but made literally into a loop. So put those two, uh, put Corbeau and uh, it's called uh, Earth Building Tulo in Chinese together. So I, I did a, a sketch like that. And that kind of a strange shape actually is, uh, oh, okay, that's a photo of uh, the model. And then it's, it's from the site. Because actually in the original site, that whole area you see were the, uh, for sports facilities, there's, uh, a soccer field and, and basketball course and so on. And then in order to be able to accommodate more countries, they actually push the sports field up and then created three lots. And then there's a new uh, Tunisian uh, pavilion next to the Chinese pavilion and the Francophone pavilion. Altogether, three new buildings. So it's kind of a difficult shape really to, uh, to accommodate uh, the building. Interestingly, what we got from our client is a number of rooms, 300. So after all these years, <laughs> so uh, we, we back to uh, 300 rooms. And then uh, what, what you can see is that uh, it got to be, a, because it's a single loaded corridor, it got to be a little taller building, eight stories, but we created a garden uh, in the middle. So when uh, the people move around, in this case, it, it, it's around this uh, garden. And, and then uh, everyone, all the students would look out. And then, were we happy with the single loaded corridor? Not exactly, because the repetition would, would make a building uh, not as lively, perhaps. It, it's a, a simple, a formal uh, problem. So we decided to use uh, the uh, exterior wall to create a, a reason. So it looks like this. That's uh, like a week ago. We were on the uh, construction site. And then meanwhile, we had to uh, give identity to, uh, or rather cultural identity to this building. Um, in the early days, the Japanese pavilion would have a traditional uh, uh, pitch, curved linear uh, roof, and so on. But we thought um, maybe we could use the craft of making the building as the message for uh, cultural identity. So we used the, the brick. It's not from China. That was the idea, but it turned out to be very complicated. And then we picked uh, a French brick. Oh, this is not the French brick. <laughs> this is the Chinese brick. We were learning from the, the different ways of laying brick from the traditional Chinese buildings. And then this is uh, the southern facade facing the periphery. If you are familiar with uh, Paris, it's the ring road. This is the southeast corner of uh, periphery. So that's the facade. And then this is a, a very traditional way of making a cantilever in China. Uh, in Chinese, it's called die se. And that's what you see there. And then inside the courtyard, our garden, 
And then there's a staircase would take you all the way to the rooftop. Since 2008, uh, around 08, 09, President Sarkozy had a, a grand Paris plan and then um, pretty much uh, demanded all the public buildings should have uh, the uh, uh, rooftop open as uh, for uh, landscape. And then, of course, we are obliged. And then here you can see the Eiffel Tower <laughs> far away. So anyway, uh, that's that. And then I'm getting into uh, something. Uh, it's, for me, it's probably uh, very important is how uh, the, the content in this case uh, could interact with form so that form and content are both created at the same time. We had a, a project to design an art museum for the first abstract painter in China. His name is Wu Dayu. Most people in China probably don't know the name at all. He, uh, since 1950s, he uh, lost his job as a teacher, as a professor. So um, he taught at uh, um, uh, the China Academy of Art today um, in Hangzhou. And he went home and stayed in his uh, uh, tiny little attic, about 10 square meters, and did paintings of this size, postcard size, thousands of them. And this is uh, uh, one of them. And uh, um, so the, uh, 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 an art dealer decided uh, to uh, build an art museum for, for him. Eventually, it didn't work out. So now we call the, uh, the, the museum the no-name art museum. Uh, but actually, uh, it was for him. And he was also a poet. This poet, it may look similar to the, 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 fir, uh, the one I, I showed at the very beginning, but actually this is a classical slash modern poem. Although the lines are consistent and you, you see a, a number of words, actually seven characters also typical to classical um, poems, but yet this poem is very different. There's no rhymes and there's uh, no this kind of a dictation of, of uh, pitches. And then the content is really about an experience in architecture, or I guess the word architecture didn't show up anywhere. So it's about the interaction between shadow and figure, time and space, and about the poet himself moving without a sound. And then, of course, as he said, he's in and out, this contradiction, darkness of the light. I was very much inspired. And then uh, and I, I saw the limitation of diagram of space. I decided to try to uh, diagram time for a change. And this is based on a French philosopher, Francois Droulin's book on time. The book is about a comparison of Eastern time and Western time. So on top is the, uh, the Western time, and as according to, I'm paraphrasing uh, uh, Julian here. So the idea is the observer of time is outside of time. So he's looking at the beginning and the end of time. And then time can be evenly divided. It goes to one direction. So it's a, a objective time. But what's interesting about this objective time is that there, there's past, there's future, and there's no uh, present. 
Western philosophers trying to solve that problem now for centuries. But anyway, no, there, there are some uh, possibilities, but we, we uh, leave it there. And the Chinese time, or Eastern time, according to Francois Julien, is the uh, subjective time. So the observer is inside of the time. So you don't see the beginning and the end. And most importantly, that the person is moving towards time while time is coming towards you. So uh, uh, in, in this case, there is only present, no past, no future. It's very important for me, it's not uh, if I agree with his uh, philosophy or not. If time can be as objective, oh, sorry, subjective as Julian suggested, and there's a chance to design it. So the whole question is, uh, actually both time and space, one is truly subjective, actually you can design it, so you don't always uh, measure the space, you experience the space, it's as simple as that. So this is a, a traditional Chinese uh, um, garden uh, bridge. All this uh, zigzagging is about enlarge the space because you spend more time crossing it, the water must be wider and then uh, uh, so the space is bigger. Talk of that, we use uh, a single point perspective as the device, uh, which is like a, a wedge, a shape, and to organize the entire uh, uh, museum. So what do you see as, some uh, in the plan, of course, uh, uh, you see the, the tapering happen this way, but also sometimes like that, and so on. And then the whole idea is not so much to make the museum bigger or smaller, but to say maybe in the end, you realize both time and the space are immeasurable. You can't measure them. The, the measurements is uh, itself just a tool, a device. So we, we use in an optimistic way, uh, perhaps. So here is the same wall. It's longer on the left and probably shorter uh, on, the, on the right because of the exaggeration of the perspective or the shortening of the perspective. And then I'll show you uh, another space, uh, the one on the right, that, that little uh, wedge. So this is one direction, the other direction, uh, two, uh, two uh, distinctly different uh, experiences. This one uh, is meant to be a water court because uh, the project uh, was uh, semi-abandoned, so they never did the landscape nor the interior. So it's like this for now. Um, here is how to let the passers-by to look in that space. The wall is being lifted up. Uh, another pond, which is not there and then uh, uh, very much uh, um, exaggerated in a perspective. More of that. And then the curvilinear space is meant to really disrupt this, this uh, reading of uh, a classical perspective, a triangular space inside of the gallery eventually, hopefully. And then the shallow is the space, and then a transparent space made with uh, clay tiles. The tea house. So anyway, uh, here, what I'm suggesting is that the temporal and the spatial experience is the content, is being designed, but not. The, the practical needs of uh, 
uh, the spaces. So that designing that experience um, and uh, of course the form are really the, uh, um, the same act this, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, or rather the same coin of two sides. So anyway, and here uh, is the, uh, uh, another art museum. And this time is the only time actually we were able to uh, help the client to make a decision on the site selection. Um, the client really didn't uh, ask us to help him with that. <laughs> he picked a nice big flat piece of land in the development zone outside of uh, the old city. So when I saw it, uh, I thought that uh, why people should make an effort to go to see art. Um, some of these folks probably uh, are, are not really uh, uh, exposed to art uh, in their life much in the past. So maybe we should be uh, more proactive. Let's bring the art into the city to near where the population is. And then uh, the client bought the idea. So in the center of the old city is a river. So our building, our museum should be a bridge. And then you can see the bridge allow the cultural facility to connect the fabric on both sides of the river. And this is the traditional covered bridge in China. The virtue of a covered bridge is very different from a, uh, an open air bridge. It's place people would go there, to uh, older people to go there to meet with friends and play chess and maybe the kids will go there uh, and do something. So there are vendors in these bridges, sell little snacks and so on. So it's like a, a salon, like uh, really a, a linear uh, square. So we liked very much that idea. And then uh, we reintroduce it here. Here you see the bridge uh, as the architectural design goes. Uh, on the bottom, uh, there's a steel bridge because the material actually was, was uh, recommended by the Water Bureau. Uh, steel would allow the maximum amount of flood water to go through and the uh, members of the steel would also cut the, the tree branches and so on to, to uh, really make the, the, the flood not an issue. So the lowest point of the building already is above the 50 year water mark, uh, flood mark. So anyway, so on the top is the concrete bridge and with a painting gallery inside. Between the two bridges, is a, a great exhibition hall. It's like mostly three uh, spaces in, in this bridge or building. So it looks like this. You see the steel bridge for pedestrians and then the art museum on top. And this is uh, the uh, uh, pedestrian bridge. So when people uh, pass through it and eventually actually I'll show you, people can, can stay if you want. And, and also can go up to the museum. So the question we had was that, what if people still don't go to the art museum? Is there any way uh, to uh, bring art closer? So what we decided to do is to have two uh, huge skylights on the floor of the art museum. So if you look up, you'll see something uh, you like and then maybe next time you would go into the art museum. So that's that. Some folks on the bridge, the big exhibition hall, exhibition, a painting gallery, empty and full. And then uh, there are two uh, entrances to the art museum because it's a bridge. One side, the other side. 
and then go in from one side, there's a elevation difference. So a staircase to take you into the painting gallery and then come back down from the staircase like that. So that's that. So that was about selecting the site first because of the site was suggested by the architects. We also help the client to imagine how to program the bridge, becomes a mixed use bridge, passing of the bridge and then uh, going into the art museum. Here is uh, the last project I'd like to present. It's again, a fairly rare, it's getting less rare now, but that was the first time the client invited us to participate in programming the building in a particular way. Basically, the question, the president of this art university, China Academy of Art in Hangzhou, he uh, said to the three uh, finalists for the design competition, he said, you all architects who, uh, who teach on the side, could you uh, help us to uh, imagine the uh, uh, educational system of this campus? And uh, uh, that's what I did. So I couldn't um, help but to put uh, you know, my experience teaching here in the US and some also in China. But also, it's about my experience teaching architecture. So I made a number of suggestions here uh, with this, uh, uh, again, a big diagram. So hands-on experience is very important for all students, not because you are studying art, even if you're studying something else, to use hands and the brain together, I thought it was very important. And not to say that I learned so that's the motto of uh, MIT, actually. <laughs> it's man's, uh, madness. But anyway, uh, so in the early years, the first two years, so that becomes something important. And then what you learn, so you learn the typical drawing, that's fine, and maybe programming uh, with using your computer, also important. But every student should learn architecture. It's, architecture is part of the general education at this campus. So I was fantasizing because who knows if we're going to win or lose the competition. So, you know, I may as well. So, uh, anyway, and then for the upper years, it's all about structuring the learning and teaching our courses around research topics. And then because it's so much about making, not only uh, just uh, reading or, or writing, the students should live upstairs of the studio so they can come down in the middle of the night to work on their projects and go up to take a nap whenever they want. And then within the uh, um, dormitories, students can organize hobby class by themselves as courses because they may realize a course they're interested in but not offered by the school and then they would uh, uh, somehow uh, organize and, and, and uh, make it into a course and earn, earn a credits as well, so on and so forth. And uh, we did win the competition. Uh, so that was our, our design of the campus. So there is a mat building for studios covering as much as possible the land. So of course it's a piece of wetland and then you see the water being uh, capped. And then uh, I couldn't help to diagram the experience of going through uh, the studio. And this is a photograph showing if you look 
in one of uh, the bays of the studio, you turn right and you turn left. So that would be like here. Here is a section, so you see the studio all the way across the entire campus. And that's the first stage when it's uh, completed. Inside of the studio, you see the, lum the number of bays and number of layers. And then a uh, yeah, typical bay would look like this. North facing uh, windows, very traditional. And on the outside, On the second floor uh, roof, there actually, there's a whole uh, um, pedestrian circulation system. The courtyards. So uh, we also thought about, since we programmed this space, so we better think more about the folks we are actually trying to design this building for what they were, what's their transportation, and so on. And then students in uh, 1935, um, they, they dress up like that. And then some are uh, American uh, architects, they, uh, they dress like, <laughs> like, like of Maybach, by the way, wizard, the wizard designed that rope himself. That's what I heard. That's true, right? And Richardson was not as inventive to just put on big monk rope. But anyway, so that's that. that project now is being kind of a slow one. Yeah, we're going to pick up and do it and then. So they probably would have uh, these kind of uh, uh, vehicles around for. And here is the reality of these kids. And uh, in the dormitory, and every other floor of the dormitory, there's a big public space. And then hobby clubs. Now they're all together 12. This is the very first one, <laughs> yes. the archery uh, club. Every student has to study architecture. So there are so many students, so they make uh, collectively make uh, a model of the campus. That they are designing um, the way they would engage, they would own uh, the, the campus. Normal, traditional classes, Studio for work and for exhibition is constantly rotating. More formal exhibitions by the end of semester and continue in the studio. And then, of course, we didn't expect uh, some uh, badminton going on in there because of the height. Uh, it worked out very, very well. And then uh, stage performance, um, film, and then on the outside of the studios, and they are places for people again, to have life, they may take a, a cigarette <laughs> and uh, uh, or, or just uh, um, look at their um, iPhones and so on. So, so between the outside and inside, not only there is a, a, a semi-covered space, but rather a places, again, for some people events to unfold. And inside of the uh, dormitory, because the uh, lower level are fully connected with studio, so you can see uh, all their work and, and, and uh, uh, 
the, the, the rather the chaotic condition of the studio started to, uh, to invade into the dormitory, which of course is uh, perfectly uh, all right. So at this campus, the first class starts at 8.30 in the morning. So students now get up at 8.15. <laughs> and they just like, go downstairs, that's it. And uh, what, about, well, the, what about a few things? But what about breakfast? Oh, maybe I should tell you, see this kind of a pretty clean uh, facade actually is a mask again. Because in China, typically, students wouldn't use a, a dryer. They use washer. So they like to put up their uh, laundries uh, up in the balcony. So here you see. OK, so wash clothes uh, is uh, one issue. And then breakfast, back to breakfast. So that's what uh, now uh, they have. So they don't have time for the canteen. So there are vendors set up. Uh, breakfast right outside the studio. So on their way, they can pick up, uh, uh, in Chinese, it's shaobing. It's like a breakfast pancake. And then just go in and eat. And then students also take on our building in a number of ways. And this is, uh, they, they turned uh, our building back into a line drawing by doing projection and projecting whatever. The best one, the best one, or rather my favorite, is the next one. So I hope they uh, will realize it uh, sooner or later. <laughs> I guess. Um, I'm suggesting that when you do architecture a certain way, you may help them to uh, open up uh, uh, to, to uh, some possibilities. So now uh, the uh, second stage is in full swing, should be then uh, uh, next year before September for sure. And then back to uh, the beginning of the talk. So what about part T? What about form and content and so on? Um, it's a, an ongoing uh, investigation. So this building here, we started with uh, the structure. So it's sort of like paper fan shape. Um, actually, because I do a lot of a re really uh, um, boxy, uh, rectangular square buildings. And then my partner uh, really uh, doesn't like the idea. And uh, she uh, suggested that we, we be a little more adventurous. So I, I obliged. And now for the, the spatial organization here, it is rather, uh, maybe I shouldn't say organization. It's the disorganization of the space. So basically, we, we turn the building in such a way that there are three connected space looking out in different directions. So what is the program for this space? From the name, you will get an idea. This building is called Faculty Student Activity Center. So they don't, <laughs> our clients don't have a clue yet how to use it. Um, and then with this university, also you may want to know that uh, we used only half of the typical uh, budget of uh, a campus in China. It's 4,000 RMB per square meter. Uh, why so low? Because uh, the university, uh, when they budgeted uh, the project, they, they made a mistake. They couldn't change. So we had to uh, work with it. So anyway, so here you can see the possibility maybe for a new space. It was somehow uh, uh, may, may, may be dictated by the, the structure. And then it would also lead to a new program. So the connection of the two projects and the content and form 
at this moment uh, is where it is. Thank you. Seat like this, I think of Gropius's total theater, <laughs> rather than this frontality. Um, thank you. Can we jump right in? Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So was it um, too long? It probably was. Uh -huh. It was too long. No, it wasn't. I was too long. Um, it was perfect. Um, Stefan, uh, who is one of the associate deans here, who administers events, was encouraging me to make sure we left enough time. So there isn't that much time. I, maybe I'll ask one question and hand it over and then quickly get to the audience. Uh, there's so many people here who know Young Ho and Li Jia, but also, like I say, the student questions have been amazing. Um, Young Ho, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to you're very disarming, and I say that as a, both like a, somebody who just, first time I've heard you give a full lecture at GSAP, I think it's the first time you've ever done that. You've been on panels here before, but he's never uh, had the room like this before, and I'm thinking of some of the lectures this semester have been like that. They're kind of old-fashioned, frankly, in an era of panels more than full-blown lectures. Uh, so you've had time to kind of build something up there. Um, as a friend and, and colleague, you are disarming in the sense that you often seem to be having so much fun and delight that it's, it's hard to then want to kind of go back to the critique side. But earlier today, uh, while I was e texting Yahoo and asking, is this accurate? I reminded, uh, asked, I said, you did read Roland Barthes carefully, right? And, uh, and uh, I'm assuming death of the author, people in the room probably don't know this work, but but you wrote back saying, yes, yes, absolutely, and it was a big influence. So I don't need to bring up Roland Barthes to do this, but as you progress through this today, the, I don't know what the audience saw, um, but the, I was thinking you go through form and content, and you take us back to like elemental aspects of being in school and show us they're not so elemental at all. You mentioned at one point you said if we work this out, we might have a chance to design something. You didn't mean professionally. You meant that there might be enough intellectual work done or insight or creativity that there's something new to do. <laughs> like you earn this possibility to do something. And you often disaggregated that from the client. You, in fact, said, I imagine the client, even when you had a real client. And, uh, when I was young, somebody told me Mises' client was philosophy, and I went, whoa. <laughs> so, but you reminded me of that today. But when you got to the part where you decided you were designing the time and the space, and the one passage was uh, the building doesn't effectively know the person is there. They don't make a sound or a trace. Mm. And at that point, you were describing Eastern and Western time. I'm thinking of Sanford, who spent so much time trying to take us there at Rice. But without me acting like a scholar of those issues, even though I, I care about them, what was on my mind often was, is there a point and where you really move into abstraction? <laughs> and I'm thinking quite literally, Alfred Barr in the show at MoMA, that I think inaugurated MoMA, he described Malevich as more abstract than Kandinsky. Yes. And Frank Stella will say, well, Kandinsky is more abstract, and he literally says it, Kandinsky is more abstract than Cezanne and he shows you why. Mm -hmm. So in your case, when the students drew on your building there, yeah. and sort of, they were sort of re-abstracting it back, but not to sound critical, they, they gave us a good view of the very thick concrete floor. Right. <laughs> so, so is Li Jia also demanding that your floors get thinner <laughs> or that your building can get more abstract? I also kept thinking of Giacometti, the palace at 3 a.m., that. Yeah. You're putting a yeah. person into the building yeah. and you're trying to get the building in effect to disappear, but you're also demanding that the syntax and structure of the building be dealt with. I mean, this is like an old fashioned conversation, but I think he kind of demanded. I, I, I'm old fashioned. So. Well, you're, yeah, but you're building modern China, so you're, you're hardly old fashioned. <laughs> so, yeah. For your question, uh, but see, abstraction right. is the big question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's it's, it. uh, yeah. for me, sure. it's an important uh, question. I uh, I actually don't use that word that much in lectures, but I think a lot. And only once uh, a couple of years ago uh, at GSD, uh, 
Scott Cohen was a person all of a sudden mentioned, you like abstraction very much, don't you? <laughs> because it's not that easy to see. I think in my way of thinking, um, abstraction is very important. And the, 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 the set of references, you know, like Malevich for one, is always there. Um, but yet, when that abstraction is being materialized into building, and then the, uh, the tectonics of the building tend to take over. So it makes me think that uh, it's not so much a white box would make an abstract building, but a well thought out, a clean kind of a con uh, set of uh, uh, relationships of a building, may maybe at this point for me would, uh, would uh, be the expression of, of uh, abstraction. I, I, I'm not making much sense. No, but the, the, just to add a fragment and then really give it maybe to Gali in the audience is, you also, I've always believed, but I see it more tonight, you spend a lot of time producing a quasi theorem before you act. Mm. And you, you know, I don't know enough about this work. It's a long time ago when I was an architect, not a linguist, but the, the degree to which, you know, there was Noam Chomsky and, mm. and uh, George Lakoff at Berkeley, like all the work on not denying the presence of syntax, yet at the same time, of course, wanting to cause it to evaporate at times. That's where I'm going. And, I feel as if you are kind of triggering this, I was thinking of the Hayduck essay, Out of Time and Into Space uh, from the 80s. The tension and compression may have therapeutic value to the docile, but the question remains, I'm pretty close to the accurate here, what happens when tension exceeds compression? <laughs> Things kind of turn inside out, and he was discussing Carpenter Center. Yeah. But so yeah. the, at Carpenter Center, the physicality isn't gone. The tension and compression he was describing as effectively kind of coming undone and flipping inside out. Anyway, I don't mean to take you through references that have come from a different era, but my question would be, and this is not the right moment to do it, this, this insistence on the facts of architecture and then the role of the theorem, the imagination, and the exceeding of the limits, that was, that was really there. And that moment of, I think, heading into saying you're designing the time and the space, no longer the form and the content. That's where I felt like you were heading. Okay. But, um, but. Um, well, it was an amazing le lecture. Thank you so much. A lot of very interesting and revealing moments of uh, your architecture and your life. And so uh, my question is, uh, um, there are some students in, in the audience, and they probably have some of the questions that you had at some point. And what I would like you to tell us is there was a moment where you were in the United States and you decided to go back to China and establish your firm. And you call your firm Atelier. And so would you um, tell us, I know that time comes at us rather than we go through time. So I, I am uh, of, your, of the thought that, um, that we are always in the present. Uh, but can you tell us that moment where you made a decision to, um, to take one bifurcation on your life? Um, tell us a bit about that. All right. Uh, actually, it's very easy, but uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty long story. Uh, so what happened was that, um, you know, I said, some of the buildings I showed today were designed in 1991. Um, I was at Berkeley. I wanted to have a, a tenure track job. <laughs> I didn't get it. So I was wondering what's going to happen next. Um, but back in my mind, I wanted to do one thing because after already eight years of doing paper architecture, I wanted to build. To build. But I don't know, uh, there's no way for me to have a client 
in the US, it seemed that way. And then uh, uh, Li Jia and I, we were traveling in Europe on, on a scholarship. And uh, um, as for all the practical reasons, we ended up back in Beijing in spring uh, 1993 for Chinese New Year. And then a friend of a relative of Li Jia came in and just to say hi. And uh, she, he didn't really know what we do anyway. And he asked, and then we told him we're architects. And he said immediately, hey, you can uh, design a building. <laughs> and then we got our first project. As in uh, uh, sh the city of Shantou, it was called uh, an entertainment center, which was a casino, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it, what I'm telling you is that it's not entirely uh, you know, accidental we started uh, the practice we wanted to build, but it's quite incidental the way we started. And then uh, uh, we did a series of projects. None of them got built. I went very far. And then I went to Houston to join Michael to teach I write Sanford and Indian. Indian. <laughs> so anyway, and then after three years going back and forth between Houston and, and Beijing, uh, we decided to practice full time. Uh, Fantastic. That was a more serious, more informed uh, uh, decision. So I guess the question behind your question is that we would it really do it if we know uh, how hard it was? The answer probably is no. It was so hard. Uh, if, if we knew it was that hard, I'm probably just going to stay in the US teach more or <laughs> what. So, but anyway, and then whenever we wanted to give up, there's a little progress being made, little hope popped up and so on, and we just kept the going. Fantastic. Mm. Yeah. It's to, to, uh, yeah, it's not a question. To, in tonight's lectures, as much as I've known you a long time, it's the first time I saw, in a way, the theorizing or the theorems and the working it out in the head from Durand, for example. And right. when you said, and Hadek did this one, I was thinking quarter house, half house, three quarter. But I, I made the connection, assuming you might. Without that time, not building, it seems to me part of the way you have survived the intensity of building is by in fact being able to hold the values in as part of your imagination. Yeah. And you said that over and over tonight. Yeah. I imagined, I imagined, I imagined. Right. And, uh, right. That, that to me was quite remarkable. No, so, I, I appreciate the, the 80 years. I, I just, if I didn't get the opportunity, I would, I would go on somehow. But uh, I already was anxious. Yeah, that period of time, yeah. Massimo Scolari and like yeah. Raymond Abraham and so many people who deeply valued working with an imagined proposition, Levius which we know Wood. is Levius Woods. Mm -hmm. and uh, Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I hope we haven't killed the enthusiasm of your questions. Uh, there's a hand. Uh, there's a... Um, thank you, Professor Chong. It's an amazing lecture. I, we, I believe we're all very inspired. I have one question. Um, I can see that in a lot of the projects that you proposed, it kind of have a minimum um, definition of utilization so that allows for the reinterpretation and redefinition of your space that fall, that function follows the form. So how do you imagine the potential or intention of um, kind of having an urban or a more massive scale of that adapt adaptation when maybe the buildings or architecture has, has to have more um, definition of the usage? Hmm. Th that's actually a uh, very interesting question and we, uh, we are, I'll put it this way. First of all, so I, I talked about today that 
form may not follow function, or it could be the other way around, and so on. But what's interesting is that space and structure could be really an independent notion altogether. It doesn't really require uh, a content to begin with. So in the past, uh, when, when Solomon had that slogan, he was referring specifically uh, to the new uh, modern uh, industrial buildings. The form follows function and the production of something would follow the, the workshop space. It, it probably did. I, I don't think I, I would uh, say uh, Solomon got it wrong. But those spaces, because they're just open base, like the Liangzhu Xiaoyuan, uh, the campus I showed, that they are open to other uses. So I think sometimes it's the space, sometimes the structure we design today should give the possibility of reuse a chance. So it doesn't matter what it is. So now a factory is turning into cultural facilities, housing, and so on and so forth. But it wasn't meant for that. But it is open big space. So typically today for housing, I believe that the, the, the housing units, the structural system is probably not the appropriate one because it makes the rooms are, are too uh, close and too small. So there's, that's a, another a big story. There's a Dutch guy. His name is uh, John. He, he was uh, also a chair of uh, Department of Architecture at MIT before. What's his name? He, did the, he, he actually invented a... Habraken. yes. He uh, invented the, uh, the open building system. It's very, very interesting and relevant today. And, uh, so remember that John Harbour, I can take a look. Hi, thank you for that um, presentation. There's so much work that we see that you've created, which is really incredible uh, to see in his trajectory. I think what's striking to in the images of the architecture is something that's very visible, yet maybe not as visible unless you start to see it. Um, and I think it really comes through in the materiality, right? So there's a lot of um, wood form concrete. There's a lot of uh, specialized bricklaying. There's a lot of you know, handcrafted tiles. And all of these materials, which are very expressed, have a really high content of labor attached to each of the materials and how they're expressed. And there's a monumentality to all the architecture. I wonder if you could speak a little bit on your choices of how, you know, in terms of making a design, how, how do you sort of decide how to coalesce the making of something to the expression of something in, the very, you know, in a very real and material and procedural way? Um. First of all, for, um, for ourselves as architects, the materiality is very important because today we live in two worlds. We live in the virtual worlds of, of uh, technology as well as the old-fashioned old uh, tangible reality. So it's very important to think that architecture would have a reason to be around, because uh, as an architect, uh, I have been asked, God knows how many times, uh, why do we still need architecture? Because we have the, the virtual uh, uh, world. My answer is this, the, the, the tangible world can be different, and architecture can make it as a more intense experience. So the weight, the texture, the color, um, it go goes on and, and uh, should give us a, uh, something very different 
than uh, what, what we see on the computer screen, even maybe on a virtual reality, a gargoyle or something. So from that uh, particular uh, uh, standpoint, I think that architecture should not uh, be uh, um, just a uh, smooth, like, a, like a, a thin surface. And then to work with the construction team is a different story. Um, since we have been practicing for almost 30 years, next year will be our 30th uh, anniversary. And then I find that on one hand, it's very hard to convince uh, the uh, construction workers to learn. And a lot of them don't. But on the other hand, some can get really interested. And not only they learn, they become uh, uh, really uh, uh, in the aura partner, uh, partner in crime or something. We work together uh, to maybe to, to to improve upon, even invent uh, certain things. So, and also uh, uh, sometimes the, the project manager for the client could uh, be uh, uh, someone uh, which would uh, share our interest and even ideal. It's a long process, but after 30 years, we know uh, some people now we can call them and ask them questions, how can we pour the concrete in a certain way, and then maybe uh, questions about other materials and, and so on. You're working with the building institutes, though. So. Oh, they, 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 they are terrible. <laughs> You're on video. Okay. Oh. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care much. But I'm thinking uh, but, of the, the project. Yeah. It was, no, one, we, it was one project, but you the concrete and the yeah. fiberglass no, too. Yeah, we work with the university on that. And you, yeah. And there's much more to that. I assumed you wouldn't yeah. show it tonight, but that was that was you specifically looking at building techniques, systems, yeah. embodied energy. Do, yeah. do you do you enjoy building? Do you do you do you like building? Do oh, very much. That's the only reason to stay in architecture. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when I go to a, a construction site, it's full of problems. Right. But I still love it. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I can tell. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, Working in the office every day is not as uh, exciting, but to uh, go to the construction site, a different story. L let me uh, want to say one thing. The design in institutes, we need to collaborate with all the time. Yeah. They are the hardest souls to get them inspired or interested. I don't know why, because somehow they, they are like, just ma machines yeah, to I produce. I don't mean to drawing, bring critique. Yeah. I, I yeah. saw Stephen's uh, linked hybrid drawings that preceded going to the Design Institute and came back. But, but uh, maybe we, there's a conversation there. But I, I think uh, Sanford Quinter had a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is my second lecture uh, that I've seen of yours. The first one was like the first weeks that we arrived in uh, Texas together. And uh, what I found fascinating was just how similar some of the things are that I saw today, but also how long it took me before I realized that. So the question I want to ask you, Michael sent us off into a, a kind of a meditation on, um, on abstraction. But what strikes me so strongly in your work, and which blew me away when I first saw your presentation in 1991, is Hitchcock. And the rigor, like when you showed us the square uh, poem, the five by four um, characters, I realized that's what Hitchcock did in Rear Window. He set up a situation and he said, let's play it out. But what's fascinating about your work, and Michael invokes it when he talks about the humor, the joy, and also the perversity, <laughs> is intimacy and, um, you know, and witnessing and the idea of always uh, participating psychologically in places in, in the entire field. Like you're an I, but somehow 
you're forced into an intimacy with other things. So I know you're fascinated by this stuff. Whether you speak about it or not, I don't know. After all these years, I don't know. But I think it would be great if you did tonight. So Aris is saying that uh, I'm not perverted enough. <laughs> Perverse is different. Every time I use that word, people get angry. Perverse just means, you know, let's say dangerously playful. Uh, th thank you, but the, the truth is, to make a presentation like tonight, you know, in a year a little more, and try to uh, make sense of uh, not all of our work, of course, but uh, a great number of work together, it's actually a challenge. I kind of enjoy it, but uh, it, it, it's not a, an opportunity to do a self psychoanalysis on, on the side as well. <laughs> Maybe this is my conservatism. Uh, oh. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so yeah. Dan. Dan. And then, uh, I have three brief questions. Oh, okay. First one builds on that amazing question, because uh, I saw that kind of uh, Hitchcock in the, in the subtext here. Hitchcock's, uh, one of his main uh, uh, tropes is the MacGuffin which is the object uh, which everyone is looking for, which has no, no real importance, but sets the plot going. And I, I somehow feel mm -hmm. that you're, you're, you find these MacGuffins and, and everything starts running on its own, but then you catch up with it. Second, that's the question about the MacGuffin. The second is, form follows function was not invented by Sullivan. It was invented by Horatio Greeno in 1856. Mm -hmm. And I believe... Not, not Will uh, LaDuke? Uh, no, no, he's no. earlier. Greeno is a bit earlier. Oh, okay. If okay. I'm not wrong, Ken, uh, maybe okay. you'll correct me. Uh, and I believe, uh, uh, but I'm fascinated by the idea that you're inverting this. But Greeno is an interesting figure because he seems to be a sculptor originally, if my memory serves me. So in a funny way, uh, form following function for him, function would be something about the aesthetic as well as the living and the... And so there's something very interesting going back in the genealogy of that. And the third thing that was sort of haunting this, besides the Hitchcock and the reversal of form follows function, for me was Louis Kahn, because you mentioned the immeasurable. And Louis Kahn said, we start with the immeasurable. We then, as architects, go to the measurable. And then we must get back to the immeasurable. That's what I feel about your work, even more than the reversal of the form function, and even more than the MacGuffin. What do you think? I think you're pretty much right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you. See, uh, disarming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right disarming. Okay. disarming. Disarming. <laughs> and conservative. Uh, okay. Hello, Professor Chang. Uh, give a little bit background about myself. I'm graduate students here from Columbia, and I come from China as well. And uh, my boyfriend and I, now we currently, we are uh, building uh, like seven floors around 86 square meters housing in Ho Chi Minh City right now. And sorry, I take a note. So like we are two young, like ambitious entrepreneurs looking forward to build so many buildings that uh, offer to young people can uh, live in. We would like to build the affordable and small rooms offered to young people such as college students, or the people who just entered to the working place in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, but we were struggling to find the samples. Like, do you have any uh, architecture works, examples that could recommend to us, uh, like, based on our situations? Thank you. Yeah. It's like, it's too much. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just like, I'm asking about, like, do you have any um, work examples that could uh, re recommend to us? Uh, we can, you know, we can mirror ourselves to build like um, affordable housing. In, Afford yeah, affordable yeah, in, housing. In, yes, in Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. In Vietnam. <laughs> I'm afraid. I Thank don't you. Know. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk on the side, but if uh, I gather you're also looking for support for enthusiasm, yeah, which, yeah, yeah which he, he would be terrific at. Thank and, you, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Housing is uh, is taught here uh, at Columbia. Yes. <laughs> yes. So maybe you should take a course. It's a big subject, a very important one. Yeah. Yeah. There was a.
founded by Kenneth and Richard Plunge. <laughs> it's, it's a, no, more like more like forty. <laughs> okay. no. Kenneth is uh, Kenneth and Stephen know Young Ho quite well. Uh, other quick, I think we have time for one or two more. Wow. Hi, Stefan um, will no, try to. Speak. She has yes. a mic microphone already. Um, yeah, just a quick question. So basically, um, the architecture for um, Liu Ling really um, kind of like impressed me with me, because um, for I know like for his time that he was kind of like retreated to bamboo groves in order to get away from the political disarray, and then also um, you were doing the scholar house, which you recognize that for the maybe the. Li literati today in China, they will have to um, condition themselves among two set of lives, the, um, the, the study room and the, the Medin life routine, this kind of like conflict between the two lifestyles. And then I guess um, as a future Chinese architect in the future, I wonder how do you think we could condition our inner space, inner space with the, all the political conflicts outside and also I guess it's also very interesting to to see how, um, like, um, your house for Liu Ling was actually um, built with concrete that isolated um, the residents from the outside world, whereas Liu Ling was um, choose uh, a bamboo groove that is actually in the natural setting. So I guess this also, um, this nuance also really um, resonates with me. Um, so yeah. Well, I. I I guess what you are asking is uh, if uh, like certain materiality, certain uh, spatial quality uh, are, are perhaps more uh, practical or more uh, desirable. Um, actually, all I presented, they are uh, not the only solution, you have to understand. So a house could be very open. You know, I, I, I'm into a glass house, but it could be partially open or entirely closed and so on. It depends on a number of things. Uh, view is one of the uh, criteria, and, and also could a, a, a house open, again, like a vertical glass house, you know, upward, uh, and, and so on. For material, it's, it's also about uh, 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 choices. For instance, actually, I like to get back to concrete. So we have thought about doing less concrete buildings for years now. But since concrete is the most available, cheapest, uh, uh, and mature, uh, technology, it's very hard not to use it. And then what do we do? So we tried uh, the uh, fiberglass uh, uh, stars uh, a little bit and, and, and a number of other things. Now we're doing uh, an also uh, engineered wood and so on. However, um, the world is changing pretty fast. This year, uh, it's about two, three months ago, um, not, uh, have you ever heard of uh, Obel Prize? Not Nobel Prize. <laughs> Obel Prize is a prize given out by some uh, uh, institution in Denmark. This year, the winning, uh, uh, the, the prize is given to some young people who invented a way to uh, extract uh, carbon from the process of making cement. No, that's fantastic news. All the things we have accumulated for the past 30 years, how to make concrete be better, we can use it again without much uh, guilt. So it doesn't mean that we're not gonna try other stuff, but uh, concrete is back on, uh, on our list as a possibility. And so uh, um, I, I, I think don't, don't Looking for, sorry for uh, both of you uh, up there, don't look for a singular answer. Right. And yeah, look around and, and you, you'll find something. Not only is good for the world in one way or another, and you truly actually 
are, are interested in. I don't think one could uh, do something just for, for the, uh, the rightness of that thing, the correctness of that thing. You also have to, uh, to love it. Probably that actually goes first. You love it, and then you also do the right thing. That would be a lot better. So uh, I'm going to look towards our dean. Uh, we're over time. Should we? But should we? I, why don't we allow one more question? And uh, I know there's more than that, but we're, or if there are. Maybe there isn't another question. There we go. Yes. There's a. Oh, yeah. Young Ho is also in town and coming to some review, so you will be able to talk to him in the hallways. So. Thank you for the amazing lecture, and I will just ask a very short question. So I saw you using Chinese poem and the metaphor of like the rhythm in your Chinese poem as to how to translate that into architecture. So my question is, in your perspective, how to create a rhythm in architecture and space? Thank you. Uh, how, how to create How to what? create rhythm in architecture and space? Because I saw you using Chinese poems and the rhythm of the poems as um, rhythm. Oh, oh, oh. rhythm. Uh, rhythm. <laughs> oh. Thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, because I saw a lot of uh, uh, Asian faces <laughs> here, is it? Um, I, I think today every one of us is culturally a hybrid. Right. You, have to, you have to accept that because otherwise, you, you're going to go back to at least uh, 100 years to the 20th century, maybe even 19th century, because uh, uh, that's how we learn, how we uh, grow up, uh, and, and how we end up. So there is no, uh, I think, a, a, a set way for you to say where to start a project. So for me, a lot of things uh, I'm interested in, but I know so little, I wouldn't dare to talk about here at Columbia in fear that uh, there are a lot of people who know a lot more than I do. Because uh, one of the examples uh, is uh, uh, Bach's music. It's fugue. I listen to, uh, uh, my wife and I, we listen to, to Bach. Not every day, but at least every week. The, the, the miraculous thing is that Bach lived 300 years ago in Germany, worked in a church, had two, uh, 10 kids. So, 21. oh, 21, <laughs> come on. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, what I'm suggesting is that I had a, you know, my life is totally different, and I'm, I'm far away from that era and, and, and uh, the, the, the habitat uh, Bach lived and worked. But that doesn't stop me to like Bach's music. So that's what's important. So that a particular poem, Wang Wei is a big, big poet in Tang Dynasty, as we all know. I tried very hard to, to like his poems, but I only like that one. <laughs> Tell you the truth. It's not like I don't like poems, I do, but I, I, one way is not a, someone I, I love that much. But you know, that poem was about architecture, about making buildings, so uh, it inspired me. And same thing for Wu Dai, uh, most of his poems I read to search for something that uh, could help me, but uh, pretty much only that one uh, did the trick, but otherwise not. So that, that's the message. So you're Chinese, you're gonna be exposed to a lot of uh, Chinese culture, that's fantastic. And then you are here also, you're gonna expose to a lot of other cultures. What about the film culture, what about Hitchcock and so on. So be very open and then you're gonna have a, a very uh, uh, exciting life ahead. Thank uh, you I, very I, much. I think that's a perfect closing. Thank you very and, uh, much. <laughs>